For those of you who uh, have just joined us, welcome. Thanks again for joining us on Chestnut Chat this morning. Um, uh, today we're joined by uh, Joanna, and I'm going to let Jared and, and you help help us learn how to pronounce your last name. Okay, Joanna, <laughs> help us with that. Uh, Malukovic or Malukowitz for the Americanized version. That's that's a lot easier for for my American tongue. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, so as usual. Um, it, the only three people who can share their screen and Kendra, as soon as I can get her on here, uh, there's only four people who can share their screen and their mic. That's me, Jared, Joanna, and then Kendra, when she gets here, we're the only people that can share a screen and mic. Um, so we can't hear you. There she is. She made it. Um, so uh, those of you who are not me, Jared, Joanna, or Kendra, we can't see you. We can't hear you. So go about your day, eat your lunch, let the dog bark, um, get the door uh, for, for whatever deliveries might be coming your way. Um, you have no potential to share your mic or screen. Um, uh, if you have something to chat about, throw that in the chat. Um, if you put a question in the chat, it's likely to get lost. So questions, please um, put that over into the, the Q&A. Um, that's the easiest way for us to keep tra uh, track of your questions. Um, typically what happens is I will let uh, our panelist, in this case, Joanna, um, give their full talk, and then we'll answer all the questions at the end. Um, Sometimes if there's a question that really uh, is, is burning or uh, a, a, a particular issue that we need to clarify as the presentation goes on, uh, Joe and I might interrupt you, but typically I'll just I'll let you have at it and then we'll answer everything in the end. Um, before we get started, I do want to put a plug in for our next two Chestnut Chats. Well, next month, March the 15th, we're going to welcome Michael Alley here from Penn State. Um, he gives talks. He's an engineering professor. And he talks about how to talk about scientific presentations. So I think, you know, in the work that we do, a lot of it is about outreach. How do we talk about the work that we're doing? And that's not just for staff of TACF. That's for uh, people who are uh, in our chapters and doing a lot of outreach. Uh, so I hope a lot of you will want to come to that and learn, learn how about to do uh, good presentations. And not just PowerPoint presentations like this, but just how to present the information well. Uh, so that's what Michael Alley will be talking about in March. And then April 19th, um, I think every year that we've done this, uh, we've talked about planting and growing American chestnuts in some way. Uh, so a couple years ago, um, I did uh, a whole set on site selection and, and installation of orchards. We did a session a couple years ago about how to obtain chestnuts and what the different methods are to, to get material to plant. But I actually don't think we've actually talked about the specific mechanisms by which you take a nut or you take a seedling and you get it in the ground and then you maintain it. So uh, April 19th, we're going to do that. We're going to have uh, a mixture of staff and uh, seasoned uh, folks who are uh, geared toward how do you put, how do you do um, direct seeding, uh, nut by nut, how do you do direct seeding, broadcast seeding, and what do you expect from that? How do you get bare roots in the ground? How are those grown in nurseries? How do you do containerized material, both as containers and then when you plant it? Uh, we'll, we'll cover the whole gamut of actually getting material in the ground and growing. So uh, mark your calendars for March 15th for um, how to do presentations of science and April 19th for planting and maintaining uh, chestnut uh, planting. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Jared, if you will then uh, introduce Joanna and this topic. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, everyone. Good morning. Um, so Joanna um, has been working with us, uh, Jason and I, Jason Holiday. We might have seen in last Chestnut Chat. And uh, she's been working on uh, discovering genes for blight resistance in Chinese chestnut. But she also is a has this history of working on uh, marmosets. So she's a primatologist <laughs> and she's been studying um, in the hybridization in marmosets. And so she has this incredible skill set with uh, computational biology and was applying these, um, you know, techniques that she's used to study hybridization of marmosets to studying hybridization in chestnuts. Um, and I think her work is very important because it kind of puts into context um, our breeding work, you know, we do a lot of hybridization between species. Obviously, the chestnut species are interfertile. They're able to make hybrids very easily today. Um, and Joanna's found 
a pretty strong, strong evidence for hybridization throughout the history of chestnuts as part of how this, um, this genus has evolved. And um, it's Im possibly important for the blight resistance, um, relative blight resistance with species. So she is going to talk about um, the origin story for Castania. So I'll turn it over to Joanna. So thank you for giving me the chance to talk about some of the work that I've been doing with chestnuts. And I, I love hybridization. It's my, one of my favorite uh, science topics, independent of system that I work with. Uh, this is actually my first time talking about this work and uh, anything with chestnuts. So please show me some grace as I go through my presentation. Uh, but okay, so here we go. So uh, I will be chatting about um, ancient hybridization and the evolution of extant chestnut species. So there are nine extant chestnut species uh, and they are found in North America uh, where we have four species that are native to the US. Then there uh, is another large clade that is found in Eastern Asia, which is a complex of another four species. And then there's also uh, a single species that is native to Europe and Asia Minor. And actually, I, I do want to highlight this one species, Castanea sativa, this, because this is uh, one of the species that I will be talking about a lot. Uh, in this presentation. And as you can see in the slide here, Castanea sativa, which is this European and Asia Minor, and Asia Minor would be considered uh, places like Turkey. So it is this really large tree. And then uh, Castanea dentata, which is representative of the native, of the, of the North American species is also a pretty large tree, whereas the As Asian species are tend to be smaller and shrubbier, shrubbier -y. And just to put my presentation and some of the work that I've been doing on chestnuts into context, these are some of the questions that I, I've been working on as I, I've been working with genomic data on chestnuts. So some of the questions that I'm interested in and that I will address in this presentation are, what are the phylogenetic patterns between Castanea species? What are divergence times between Castanea species? Do we see evidence for global and localized hybridization between Castanea species? And how could the evolutionary history of Castanea Castanea, how could it have been influenced? How could it have influenced the resistance and susceptibility of various species to chestnut blight? And do we see introgression of blight resistant variants from East Asia into uh, Castanea species that are located in other parts of the world? And then I think it's important to just define here what is hybridization and another concept that I will talk about, which is genetic introgression. So hybridization is basically when you have two different populations. It could be at the level of species, but you have genetically distinct populations that interbreed with one another. And it is, and then you get hybrids uh, which are the resulting offspring of these interbreeding populations or species. And then the related topic of introgression is when, when you look at phylogenetic history, phylogenetic history historically or normally, divergence patterns go as this is, so you know you have a main lineage that breaks off, and then you have another lineage that will break off. And then you have uh, these two final lineages, which here, these would be considered sister species that diverge from each other. And normally when we look for similarities and differences in the, the, in the genome or the DNA of various species, we will expect 
more often than not for sister species, which are the most recently diverged within a group to share the, to share more genetic similarity between each other than let's say A and C or A and this out group. But what happens with hybridization and genetic introgression is that you will sometimes have hybridization between two lineages that are not sister species. So in this case here, B, even though it's more closely related to A, actually there was hybridization here between B and C. And in this case, there is more genetic similarity shared between B and C than between A and B. So this sharing here through hybridization, we call this genetic introgression. So I just wanted to define those two concepts because I will be referring to them throughout my talk. Now getting back to chestnuts. So the natural geographical distributions of Castanea species, as I mentioned, consist of Eastern Asia, where in this case, this here is China, and we see that Castanea mellissima, Castanea sanguinei, and Henryi are native to China. Then our native North American species uh, are mostly are located on the east coast of the U.S. and then uh, go down into the southern part of the eastern U.S., as you can see here. And then Castanea sativa is found throughout Europe, and the green part here in this illustration is thought to represent the native range of sativa. And when we look at the phylogenetic relationships between these species, what we see, this is our main phylogeny that we produced for these nine species. And we see, not surprisingly, when we take ge geography into consideration, is that the East Asian species are most closely related to each other and then the North American species are mo more closely related to each other phylogenetically. And then here in this phylogeny, it shows that the European species is, is more closely related or the sister group of the North American species. And another important, a very important factor in the story of chestnuts is, of course, Cryphonectria, the fungus that causes chestnut blight. And we made another phylogeny to try to, to estimate divergence times of Cryphonectria. And what we found is that Cryphonectria evolved after the divergence of Asian chestnut species. And what we see, one, one thing that is really interesting is that we see continuous variation in blight resistance among Castanea species. And with Chinese chestnut or Castanea mollissima being the most resistant to chestnut blight. And what's very interesting is that the European chestnut is only second to Chinese chestnut in its level of blight resistance among these nine Castanea species that are extant today. And also too, there are various species of Cryphonectria and Cryphonectria parasitica is the most virulent, whereas the other species of Cryphonectria are less virulent uh, relative to Cryphonectria parasitica. So, okay, now going back to the phylogeny of chestnuts, one really odd thing that we observed when we started first delving into the phylogenetic history of Cryphonectria, 
and the phylogenetic history of chestnut species. And one of the first questions that we were interested in is, what are the divergence times of chestnut species? And what are the divergence times of Cryphonectura species? And where exactly in the timeline of chestnut divergence does Cryphonectria parasitica appear? So that was the, the motivation for making phylogenies. And in making these phylogenies, we noticed something very interesting among chestnut species themselves. So I'm gonna put Cryphonectria, the, the Cryphonectria question aside for a second, because here things start getting very interesting in the evolutionary history of chestnut species. So usually when you make phylogenies, you want to try to use at least two different approaches to see whether your results agree and give you the same tree or not. And in our main phylogeny, as I mentioned, we saw that the European chestnut groups most closely with North American species. But then we used a slightly different approach to make a different phylogenetic tree, even though these are based on essentially the same set of genome-wide data. But in this second phylogeny here, we noticed that sativa, the European chestnut, actually grouped most closely with the East Asian chestnuts. And we said, okay, this is this is this is interesting. What what could this mean? And this is where the, the whole thing with hybridization started really started to become a snowball. So we looked into the literature to see what other researchers that are working with similar questions on chestnuts are finding, or if anybody else out there is finding anything. And there is a group from NC State that published uh, some work on the genomics and biogeography of Castanea in 2022. And one interesting thing that they found is that based on their genomic data set, they found that the European chestnut could actually be a hybrid between Eastern Asian species and North American chestnut species. And if you go back to our two trees here that are discordant or basically the position of European chestnut does not agree between these two trees, that is a classical sign when um, in phylogenetic approaches, that is a classical sign that could represent, that could be explained by a uh, admixture or a hybrid origin of a given species. So we look further into this to see if we could find similar results to, to this paper. And what we actually found was even more complex. So one of the, we, we actually have a larger set of samples and we have more, we had, a, we cover the whole genome in our data set. So we actually have a data set that could potentially give better resolution than what was published here. And what we found was that actually, yes, sativa also shows this similar pattern of possibly being a hybrid between East Asian chestnut species and North American chestnut species. But we also started to see what these blue lines here mean is that there is genetic introgression uh, going. So, so gene flow, her, I hear hybridization delivering or in, injecting new genetic material from a non-sister species. But Basically, what this illustration shows is a case of really complex hybridization between various chestnut species. These here represent the East Asia species. This is the European chestnut species. And then also the North American chestnut species. One thing that's very interesting here is that 
from the American chestnut does not seem to have experienced much. There does not seem to have been much gene flow between American chestnut and the other chestnut species that are native to North America. Whereas East Asian species seem to be kind of everybody's hype is hybridizing with everybody. So we found um, we found a, a really complex case of hybridization to our surprise among these nine chestnut species. And when we look at hybridization within the context of chestnut biogeography or what are the historical migration patterns between chestnut species, kind of what we could call the classical view of chestnut biogeography is that the Castanea genus has its origin in East Asia, and then there was migration over to Europe, and then there was migration over from Europe to North America. So that mostly fits into this complex hybridization scenario, which we found. However, the story, as we started to look more and more into, we first looked at a global perspective of hybridization, meaning how does hybridization look when we sum it across the entire genome of chestnut species versus localized, where we try to identify specific parts of the genome that could have been affected by hybridization. So going from this global perspective to this more localized perspective, we start to see even more complexity here. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is that, the, so this same group from NC State, they proposed a different sort of view of chestnut biogeography, which yes, they support that there was a migration of chestnut species from East Asia to Europe to North America, but they also suggested that North America, North American chestnut species basically experienced a two-way migration, not just from Europe, but also directly from East Asia into North America. And part of how we can explain that is that there are numerous chestnut fossils that have been found. As you can see, I have them highlighted here in the red circle. I, I forgot to highlight also in my slide that there have been chestnut fossils that have been found in, in Alaska. And we know that the, the Bering Bridge used to connect Asia with North America. So that is one possible way that this migration could have occurred directly between East Asia to North America. And it, it's plausible then that these fossil, these fossil species that are no longer extant there could have been some sort of further migration and hybridization between chestnut species that are still living today with these fossil chestnut species from the past. And also here, I put down the evolutionary timelines of when these migrations would have occurred in geological time. These are pretty ancient times on an evolutionary scale, but these, I will talk a little bit about divergence times between, between chestnut species and basically the divergence patterns and times that we see between first Castanea appearing and then the divergence of North American species and East Asian species and sativa and the American species, the timelines basically fit 
these timelines basically fit to the divergence times that we have calculated. So, so anyway, from all of this, we have this question of, could North America and Europe represent two different intergression routes between East Asian and Eastern North American chestnuts? So here, just to show you the divergence times between Castanea species. So we estimated that based on data that represents the entire genome of these species, or the entire genomes of these species, we estimated that Castanea probably appeared, Castanea and its closest relatives probably appeared around 60 million years ago. And then Castanea itself probably diverged from Castanopsis around 50 million years ago. And then the split between East, Eastern Asian species and the other chestnuts occurred about 40 million years ago. And then the split between the European chestnut and the North American chestnuts would have occurred about 38 million years ago. And these times roughly, roughly fit this pattern of migration suggested by Su and Xiang in, uh, 20, in, in 2022. So, so again, this prompted us to look further into this, this prompted and actually excited us to look further into, well, is there evidence for intergression and hybridization uh, amongst chestnut species? So we, we first used this, what is now a, a classic statistical test that is called D statistics. We first use the, we use this to try to look for further evidence of hybridization and try to identify portions of the genome where intergression could have occurred. And the D stat was actually comes from the anthropological literature. I'm sure many of you have heard that humans contain some part of Neanderthal genome and because humans and, and ancient human, because modern humans and then ancient human species have hybridized. And this D stat actually comes from that work and it's just spread to other parts of biology, both in the plant and animal kingdoms. So the basic premise of this D stat without getting too technical is basically when, again, going back to this phylogenetic relationship of when you have these two sister species that are the most recently diverged, and then you have some third lineage that is closely related to these two sister species, and then you have some more distant outgroup. And what you're looking for when you try to identify genetic integration using this D statistic test is you're trying to look for spots in the genome that are more similar to one of these sister species and this in and this just adjacent outside lineage here. And when we see in a genomic spot that there's consistently more similarity between uh, one of the sister species, let's call it P P2, and this adjacent lineage P3, if there's more similarity between them here than similarity between the two sister species, which is what is normally expected, so when there's more similarity between P2 and P3, that is a possible sign of genetic integration. And there is a global version of this test. So that basically says, yes, there was hybridization and integration between P2 and P3. And then there's also a more localized version of this test, which helps you pinpoint where in the genome integration could have occurred. So, so anyway, we, we relied heavily on this test. And as I said, this is a very well-established test and it has 
uh, since it appeared in 2012, it has spread like wildfire uh, in both uh, animal and plant work. So what we started to see is that this is a overall, like a, a broad view version of where hybridization could have occurred between whom. And what we see is that between the, the Asian species here uh, and the European, oops, sorry. Um, I didn't know that, <laughs> that my presentation could do that. Okay, what we see is that there is, um, these red squares basically represent the amount of admixture or to what percentage of the genome could be influenced by hybridization. And we see that the European chestnut and Asian species, uh, if you go by the color bar here, maybe around 15% of the the genome of sativa could have been influenced by hybridization and it's it's important also to understand that we use different we use different tests and some of these percentages will vary between tests but what we're looking for is basically consistency and some range of overlap between different tests that that we use to try to detect hybridization and levels of hybridization and what we see is that um, dentata, there's less hybridization. There is what we see, we do see some level of hybridization between Castanea dentata and Asian species. And we actually see less hybridization between dentata and North American species. And this is also just to mention here, we see the highest amount of admixture between um, Castanea pumula and almamensis, uh, which is about 40%. That's not part of our story for today. I just wanted to point this out. But what's important here is that American chestnuts share between 2 and 19% of genetic variants with Asian Castanean species due to historical hybridization. And the average that is shared between American, North American chestnut species and East Asian species is about 10%. And you have to think, well, if, if chestnuts migrated first from East Asia to Europe and then Europe to North America, how do you explain, how do you explain uh, us picking up some sort of signal of hybridization between, for example, Ozarkensis and Asian species and then Dentata and also Asian species? How do you explain that with this model of one way migration into North America? And we also looked, at, I know this is a lot of numbers, but, uh, but I, I will explain. Uh, we also looked at a similar sort of hybridization test that is also related to D-statistics to try to find what is the level of admixture or what proportion of the genome could have been influenced by hybridization between various chestnut species. And the red here in this matrix represents the level of admixture. So again, the, how much of the genome could have been influenced by hybridization? And what we see is that, for example, if you look at Ozarkensis here, this line here represents the level of admixture that we see, or you know, how, how much, how much genetic input can there be between Ozarkensis and East Asian species? And we were very surprised to see that, for example, Ozarkensis and Kanata show signs of 13% of admixture. Seguinii and Kanata, 4%. Melissima and Ozarkensis, 8%. And Henrii and Ozarkensis, about 1%. And then when we look at Dentata, we see 
between zero and, and 9%. So, and then when we go to sativa, we see admixture between sativa and North American species and East Asian species. And then again, to point this out, the highest level of admixture we see between Pumala and albamensis, you know, which are two North American species. But again, these various metrics really made us go, huh, ha can this can this one way one way model of migration between chestnut species into North America really explain these patterns? Or can it be really that North American chestnut species received migration of other chestnut species into North America directly from Europe and directly from East Asia? And these, these numbers really do suggest that it is this two-way migration into North America that has influenced the evolutionary history of chestnut species. And so then the next sort of analysis that we did was try to identify localized regions of hybridization across the genomes. And these are these sorts of plots, just, just so you can kind of understand what we're looking for. So um, the, the blue part here represents the centromere, which is a region of the genome because of its biology, we automatically discounted any sort of candidate regions here. But basically what we're, we're looking for is that we have a certain threshold that we determined and any, and we look at a certain metric and any genetic locus that has a value of a metric above the threshold line is a potential intergressed is a potential intergression region. And so here we were interested in knowing if that is there unique intergression between East Asian and North American chestnut species that did not come via hybridization between Europe and Asia Minor with East Asian chestnut species. So what we did is we looked at putatively intergressed regions between various combinations of, if you remember the, the DSTAT illustration that I showed with the sister species being P1, P2, and then the adjacent species being P3. We looked at, we looked at a case for if Pumala and Sativa are P2 and P3, if Carnata and Pumala are P2 and P3, and then if Sativa and Carnata are P2 and P3, so different combinations of, so basically we're asking is if there is introgression between Pumala and Sativa, if there is also introgression between Carnata and Pumala, and if there is introgression between Sativa and Carnata, how many regions across the genome are shared by these species? How many regions of potentially that are potentially intergressed are unique between these species? And then where do we see uniqueness and where do we see overlap? And what we found is, so, what we found is again that these numbers support this idea of two way migration into North America. And so, what we see is, for example, uh, Sativa and Cronada, there are about 1,500 regions that are intergressed between these two species under a scenario of hybridization that are unique in this pairing. And that, this is the highest number of loci here. But what's very interesting is that we also found regions that are unique to this pa pairing of hybridization being Canada and Pumala. You know, two species, one is in North America, Eastern North America, and the other one is in Eastern Asia. 
and then we also found regions that are unique, uh, that are potentially introgressed under a scenario of hybridization between Pumala and Sativa. So um, between a North American species and a European species. And these numbers really do support to us this scenario of two-way introgression into North America. And then probably the plot that we're the most excited about to show is that when we ask this question, going back to Cryphonectria, does introgression from Chinese chestnut explain the high blight resistance of European chestnut? And so what we did is we overlapped our regions of introgression, for example, between Dentata and Melissima. So these are regions here across the genome separated by chromosomes where we think introgression happened. And then we also have this other line here between sativa and melissima, and again, introgression. And these are all the spots where we think introgression may have occurred when these pairings of these species hybridized. And then here, uh, these lower regions here, these last four lines represent regions of quantitative trait loci where basically these are regions in the genomes of chestnuts where we think blight resistant genes are located. And what's really incredible is that if you look at where introgression happened in the genome between sativa and melissima, you see really strong overlap between the regions that we have identified, Jared, oh, not me. I, I did mostly this part and then Jared did this part here, but anyway, um, we see strong, very strong overlap between um, these introgression regions between European and Chinese chestnut. And you see much less introgressed regions overlapping with QTLs and uh, introgression between Dentata and Melissima. So, we're, you know, we're, we're still kind of sorting this out and working through our results, but it does seem to suggest that ancient hybridization plays a very important role in which chestnut species evolved resistance to Cryphonectria and which species didn't, as well as not only because this is a give and take, but also the level of Cryphonectria resistance that we see among various chestnut species. We think that this can be largely explained or importantly explained uh, as hybridization. And also we, our data seem to support this idea that there was two-way migration of chestnuts into North America directly from Europe and, and East Asia. So, and the sort, the sort of next steps that we will be taking is modeling biogeography of chestnut species based on our data. And then I just want to say a big thank you to Jared Westbrook, Jason Holliday, as well as a former PhD student, Alexander Koch, who was a PhD student with Jason. And I just wanted to say thank you for letting me work on this exciting data and letting me make a contribution to understanding chestnut evolution and biology. So thank you, that's my presentation. Great job, thanks so much. Um, lots of clapping hands, lots of kudos in, in the chat and the Q&A. Um, and I, I wanna thank Jared too, because he's been feverishly typing in the Q&A, answering a lot of these questions. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and ask you some of these, even though he's answered them in the written form. I still think it'd be good to get um, some of these out for folks who may not uh, be following that in the Q&A, and also just to get your take on some of these. And, and Jared, too, if, if he wants to chime in, um, that would be totally fine. Um, let's start with a question that, that Jared didn't get a chance to, <laughs> to type in yet. Um, so Terry, uh, Terry Sherrick asks, can we assume that there is no backcrossing of the non-sister species hybrids the parents. I think that would be more of a question for Jared, if you wouldn't mind taking that one. Jared. 
And we assume that there is no back crossing of the non-sister species hybrids to the parents. No, there has probably been plenty of back crossing. Um, and you see from Joanna's um, figure that like, for example, with um, the integration between um, European chestnut and Chinese chestnut, the region- Are you this one? Or no? Um, the, this that This one, yes. You see that the regions of the genome that are shared between the European chestnut and the Chinese chestnut are all over. Um, so it's likely that these um, hybridization events were numerous um, and there's probably been some selection to retain some of those like regions of the genome that have been um, shared between the species. And we've been kind of looking for like, are, are any of these adaptive? Like, um, and so we look for signatures of natural selection in these intergressed regions. And yes, we find that they are um, selected for and that they do occur in blight resistance QTLs. Um, so it suggests possibly that, especially in this figure, um, that that intergression has might explain why the European chestnut actually has pretty high blight resistance, second only to Chinese chestnut, um, and that that's been retained um, over time through selection, because um, they could easily be lost through back crossing back to sativa, for example, um, but it's been retained. And it also kind of tells us this kind of concern about the purity of the species, like that we're trying to maintain American chestnut and there there is an American chestnut that's pure and separate from these other species. Um, it's, it, I'm not saying there's not species of chestnut, but that they're not as clear cut as we had thought. And that when us doing the hybridization work is not necessarily out of the norm of what the species has experienced or what the genus has experienced um, throughout its history. Um, it, and I think to follow up on that, I, I was actually um, surprised too to see that that European was second only to to Chinese. Um, I, uh, Bruce Levine asks, uh, or he says, <laughs> I was surprised to learn that sativa is so resistant. Where does this conclusion come from? He asks. Um, that was from Hill Craddock. We did a small stem assay last year, and she'll show you the um, results here. So last year, thank you to people sent people from like all over the U.S. Uh, sent in seeds uh, from Chinese chestnut, Japanese chestnut, and all the different chestnut species to University of Tennessee Chattanooga, and we um, Hill Craddock grew these beautiful seedlings that were like five feet tall um, in their first year, and we inoculated the stems uh, with chestnut blight for all these species, and this is what we came up with. Um, this is just looking at, you know, comparing the different species and you can see dentata American chestnut is the least resistant and Chinese chestnut is the most resistant um, and European chestnut is second and not significantly different than um, Chinese chestnut. And even Ozarkensis and these uh, chinka pins are actually have intermediate blight resistance, which is also very interesting. Um, and the Asian species, Seguinii and Henrii, actually have low resistance, which was surprising to me. Because um, that, you know, the chestnut blade has been Asia, in Asia. We think it's from Asia. Um, why wouldn't these species be resistant, um, as resistant to blight? Um, one of the things that was weird is that the they didn't grow it nearly as well um, in the same pots, um, with that hill was growing the other species and optimized American chestnut. So it could be some artifact of the experiment. I don't know. Um, but it's quite interesting that the, the Asian species are not all universally resistant. I, I'd like to, I'd like to see that repeated in, in the field too, and not just, not just SSAs, but certainly, yeah. certainly interesting. Um, Russell asks, and I have to ask this too, uh, he said he directed it to me. I have no idea, but maybe you guys know where can we get a chestnut leaf fossil? <laughs> That's pretty cool. Anybody have any any lines on that? You could get pictures from Wikipedia. Oh, <laughs> not the actual in hand. Well, I know I know Russell really loves rocks, so you know if anyone has a, a bead on one of those, you know, let's see if we can get get one in Russell's hand or mine. I'll take one. Um. There were a lot of questions in the chat and or a lot of chatter in the chat. And then also a question here. 
kind of talking about timeline of, of migration and also how it relates to um, geologic um, occurrences like Pangina, P Pangea and Barangia and all this. Um, it's one specific question that I'll bring up. And, and if you want to put it into a greater context of as continents shifted and things like that, um, Ron asks, when did Cryphonectria parasitica appear in the hybridization time frame? Was that before or after introgression? Um, and maybe he means migration into North America. So there, I, I, sh I, I should have put in the um, phylogeny and the divergence times of Cryphonectria, but uh, there are, so the Cryphonectria parasitica appears after all of the migrations, but there were also other Cryphonectria species that were around and so those resistance genes were probably already there. And I would think that probably th there's this concept of pre-adaptations. So it could have been that uh, older Cryphonectra species had already been influenced, had already caused evolution and some sort of resistance uh, in Asian species. And those, those, those resistance genes could have spread and as sort of as pre-adaptations pre to Cryphonectra parasitica. Okay, thanks. Uh, so Mark Double here, uh, relatively recently retired from WVU, um, worked a lot with uh, or in the Department of Plant Pathology there at WVU. He says, our data in West Virginia from the inoculations of American, European, Chinese back cross showed that the European was just as susceptible as American chestnut. Uh, these were inoculations into trees rather than seedlings. So yeah, it sounds like that might be, might be worth um, replicating. I mean, it doesn't um, uh, void any results of the hybridization certainly, but but then has implications of what the, what the interpretation then would be, right? If, um, European isn't necessarily, and my, my, my general experience with, with I, I'd be surprised to see that Japanese isn't more resistant than, than European. Um, would you guys have any comments on that just in general, based on what you're seeing from, from the hybridization patterns? Do you wanna take that one, Jared? Repeat the question, Sarah. I mean, I guess my, my experience is that, chi that Japanese chestnut is, is pretty pretty resistant. Um, and there are individuals, in, in, I think, in the European um, species in general that have some resistance. Um, but I would say as a whole, my general observation is that Japanese are, are more resistant than, than European. And that's what I think more of the historical literature shows. Um, so I'm just curious if you can speak to that and, and what the implications might be for what you're seeing in, in, in the hybridization results. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to, like you said, you need to repeat this with trees in the field. Um, when I went up to Connecticut Ag Station, um, we did some phenotyping on Japanese, um, European, um, and Chinese and all of that. And we found that the Japanese definitely look better than the European chestnuts. Um, but the European chestnuts definitely look better than the American chestnuts. Um, so regardless of like whether this experiment is like the final, you know, um, like representative of the species as a whole. Um, I think the conclusion that there's continuous variation in blight resistance among the species is a very plausible uh, finding. Um, and that it kind of matches with this idea that there's probably hundreds of genes involved in blight resistance. Um, and that it's possible that through this integration, some of those were transferred between species um, and they, it wasn't a complete transfer. Um, and so the European chestnut might have some European chestnut individuals might have inherited more of these genes or less of these genes. Um, and that's my, and there's probably a lot of variation within species within European chestnut. I've seen some literature showing, you know, quite a lot of variation in blight resistance. And when I went to Spain, uh, recently, and I looked at, you know, these tree, you know, a lot of European chestnuts, they, some of them did have blight, but it was surprising at like how well they were doing, um, even with blight present, um, in the landscape that why maybe it's because it's drier there than it is in East, Eastern North America, but they definitely seem to have some resistance. <laughs> 
Well, I think that's a good point. And, and we, oh, sorry, Juliana. I just wanted to add too that there are probably also other sorts of fungi and blights over the history of um, Castanea that, you know, this, the same sorts of genes that are responsible, and I, I'm just, I'm just speculating here, uh, but m maybe the same sorts of genes that are responsible for resistance to blight also are the same set that are responsible for other blights and other fungi. Yeah, well, well, um, I, so cool. Um, and, and going back to um, Jared, you had talked about uh, lots of, of possible um, a variation within a species. Uh, so John Scrivani asks about LSAs, large surviving Americans, trees that are 10 inches in diameter or larger and, and looking to survive with the blight. We know of a handful of these trees. Uh, they're very cool. I know John's worked with a lot of them at, at Lasane State Forest there in Central Virginia. Um, he asks, can some LSAs have integration from sativa that we're not catching in their ancestry results? Or is that a true artifact of the Dentata um, species? I think it'd be really interesting to, um, I think we have whole genome data on uh, some of these LSAs. And so we could separately um, look at whether there's higher levels of integration or integration in uh, regions of the genome that are involved in blight resistance between, let's say, Chinese chestnut and American chestnut in those particular trees. Um, because, you know, Joanne is seeing this, uh, there is some integration between Asia, East Asian species, and uh, North American species. It's possible that through the shuffling of these genes, the inherit random inheritance, that some of the um, genes involved in blight resistance um, from Asia were inherited by American chestnut. Um, that's a possibility. So it'd be interesting to kind of see, is that happening at higher rates in these large surviving American chestnuts as compared to a typical susceptible American chestnut? We do definitely see variation in blight resistance within American chestnut. Um, so it's possible like there's maybe less of the integration than there is between sativa and melissima, but it's still there. Um, uh, Bruce Levine brings up a good point too about about uh, uh, chestnut blight in Europe, that, that Europe has widespread hypovirus like in Asia. Um, so in order to really assess it, looking at Europeans growing in North America might be a, a better gauge of overall resistance to the to the pathogen, pure pathogen if you will that's not a very good a non-infected um pathogen um well it, it, i don't want to jump to this question ab about next steps let's let's take a couple more um gail tamimatsu um, asks regarding virulence infectivity studies was one virulent strain used also age of tree or stem seedling could be a source of variability in the resistance or susceptibility because i think they use DP155, the, the very high virulent strain. Is that correct? Yeah, we we used in this particular experiment, that was EP155, which is um, from Connecticut, I believe. Um, and that's a highly virulent strain. Now, when we look at um, trees in the wild, so-called, like when we phenotype our trees for blight resistance in our orchards, um, we do account for differences in age, the different kinds of site variables like precipitation and temperature and things like that as uh, potential and environmental variables to take into account before we assess the tree's resistance. So we do take into account these other environmental variables. Um, we don't know the strain of the blight that affects all these trees, but we do try to take into account the tree's age, for example, um, in assessing their long-term resistance. But this case is just seedlings inoculated with one strain, um, EP155. Thanks, Jared. And, and just because I want you to say the name of the test, I'm going to ask Kim's couple of questions. Um, if shared DNA is used to define cladistic relationships in the timeline of divergence and identity, uh, possible integration occurrences, how do you distinguish between the two? Can you repeat the question? If shared DNA is used to define cladistic relationships and the timeline of divergence and identity possible and identify possible integration occurrences. How do you distinguish between the two? Jared actually already answered this in the in the Q&A, um, but I thought it would be good for the group to hear the answer. 
I don't under what are you trying to distinguish? Sorry, I don't understand. The um, the D stat. <laughs> so explain the D stat. That's I guess that's what he's asking. Um, how do you tell the difference between, you know, integrate uh, integration and like incomplete lineage sorting, for example, which is basically what the D stat is doing, right? So basically, the with yeah, so I I can. Just one second. Go, going back to this. While she's doing that, what's an ABBA BABA test, Jared? That's what I was hoping you would talk about. Because I mean, I just like. Really... That's actually what I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Is, the ABBA okay. BABA test is the D stat. Okay. It's the same thing. So, sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to find the yeah, here. So, so basically, with um, with incomplete lineage sorting, it will. It can occur randomly anywhere within the genome, whereas with the ABBA-BABA test, we should see this sharing more consistently within the same spot of the genome, if that makes sense. With, uh, let me rephrase this, with um, this phenomenon called incomplete linear sorting, you can have genes, variants of genes, either ancestral or derived, kind of randomly inherited by one branch of the phylogeny or the other. And by chance, with the, the, the idea with the D stat is that you would expect this randomness to be kind of shared 50-50 between different branches of the phylogeny. But if you see that you get derived more derived alleles shared between two non-sister species, like in this case, um, P2 and P3, um, then you see like an excess of that, like let's say 70% of the genes are like this pattern, the P2 and P3 sharing versus P1 and P2, then you would say that that is probably due to introgression and not due to random chance, due to the um, inheritance, the random inheritance of these um, derived alleles and in the, as, as the species are diverging. I think that's the basic idea. Do you is that how you understand it, Joanna? Yep. And this was, by the way, this was invented to uh, look at introgression between humans and Neanderthals, um, and so that was that was like in 2010 that paper came out, and they found that humans and Neanderthals share about five percent of the DNA um, due to this introgression. And uh, chestnuts share more than humans and Neanderthals. So just to put, point that out, that it um, the level of, of breeding between chestnut species is higher than between humans and uh, closest relatives. And, and the timeline divergence between humans and Neanderthals versus chestnut species. Chestnut species are much older, and the hybridization goes back much deeper than But also, plants tend to hybridize much more easily than animals. That's true. That's true. Um, a, a point by Amy Miller. Amy, thanks for bringing this up. Um, I, talking about the disease triangle, it is our observation from growing thousands of chestnuts that tree health and environmental circumstances greatly influence disease expression. Claiming to observe resistance without accounting for env environmental circumstances and overall tree health is a limitation of drawing different conclusions about disease and genomic relationships. I'd, I'd say that's true. I mean, it's somewhat minimized in pots, right? Or at least we hope so, but there's still a huge environmental effect. I mean, do you any anything else to say about that other than, yep? Well, yeah, we're trying to account for that in our assessments um, when we are making selections with uh, the breeding program. Um, so yeah, like we have environmental covariates that we know about that influence the the overall appearance of the trees, like how old they are. Uh, as they get older, they get look worse, right? Um, another really important variable is the drainage. Uh, trees that living in these clay clay soils, they don't do they don't do as well as the trees that are in well drained soils. Um, so we account for that when I. And looking at the overall resistance of the trees, like I'm factoring in all the the average resistance of all the relatives that are growing in different sites. So we're kind of average, you know, each tree is kind of 
the resistance of it is judged by itself and all of its relatives after accounting for all of the environmental effects that could influence the blight resistance. So we, we do our best to account for that environmental um, component of the resistance. It's not perfect. And the way we're trying to overcome that now is, you know, planting replicated field trials where we have the same families planted at different sites. So we can actually evaluate, you know, how does the environment influence the tree's resistance relative to the genetics. Um, Mike Alcott asks, do you think it could be possible to estimate a degree of hybridization, for example, between sativa and dentata, just by looking at the underside of the leaves with the 50X dissecting microscope? Because not all of us have an easy way to look at or get genotyping data. Well, maybe you could do that, Mike, and then we can get the genotype data and we can tell you if it will work. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, let's see. I don't know. I, an anonymous attendee uh, states it's not really a question, but I'm kind of curious to get your take on on this uh, this statement. Uh, the forests of the Smokies in China are similar due to connection before breakup of Pangaea, and and that I, uh, Jared, you had mentioned that that Kim and and uh, Fred Paye and 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 myself had talked about some of the Chinese chestnuts we had seen in China, and and it's. It, my observation that when, when we were walking through those forests, it, it looked almost exactly like the forests of the Southern Appalachians and like all the species were very similar. It's it's pretty uncanny actually. Um, he goes on to say the crossbreeding does not seem to make sense. The tree migrating over these large distances and climates seems next to physically impossible outside of the Eocene, which was very warm. The theory is interesting, but seems not consistent with geology and climate over the eons, unless <laughs> there are some supersized flying squirrels. So I don't know if you want to comment on that or if there's any any additional explanation there. Oh, I think, well, um, I... yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. The fossils, <laughs> this, like look at the fossils, um, that the fossils exist in uh, Asia um, and in Alaska and the Rocky Mountains and in Greenland, chestnut fossils. So there's definitely a pattern of polar distribution during the Eocene, um, and then climates cooled, uh, and there was more of a divergence. But there, it could be very possible that the hybridization is like very, very old, like million, tens of millions of years old. Um, and so the, that's, I think a real, a legitimate question is, uh, did that hybridization occur after or before chestnut blight came onto the scene um, and so where it's not really relevant for chestnut blight resistance at all um, or did it occur simultaneous with a, a, um, when chestnut blight came in um, and, and in that case it could be that the blight resistance spread um, between species by way of hybridization i think that's a that's a important question to figure out um, i don't know if we'll actually be able to figure that out um, but Yes, there. You can, Joanna. You can. What are these time frames? Um, can you go back to the? Um, yeah. So Paleocene, Eocene, and Oligocene. Well, while you're doing that too, there was another question about fossils. Were fossils found between China and Europe? I believe there are fossils throughout. Um, the northern part of Asia. Um, so there's a, a Castania ancestor AC here between A and C. Um, so I guess yeah, is is that same to be seen between A and E there? So there there are there are, there are plenty of fossils seen between along that span. Yeah, it doesn't look like there's fossils here um, in Europe across northern Europe. Um, I've seen that. Uh, when the climate cooled after the um, Eocene and the Oligocene, like 30 million years ago, that's when like deserts formed um, in the center of Asia, like the Gobi Desert. And that probably split the, the population into two, the European chestnut and the East Asian species split around then. And that co corresponds to Joanna's divergence dates. Okay. Cool.
Well, there's a few more questions, but I think we'll we'll wrap up a little early today, um, just uh, to to get moving along. Um, last question I'm going to take from Matteo. Um, what are the next steps in research after all of these results that have been found, or what would it be, or what would you like to be researched further in re relation to these results? What What are the next steps? I, I think we don't. Well, so the we still these are relatively new results that we that we're showing. So we definitely have to digest this a little bit more. But I think having um, doing some further biogeographic analyses based on our data to, you know, to, because right now we're, we're using biogeographic analyses of other researchers, which had slightly different data sets and uh, slightly different genomic data sets as well. So, um, so they had re reduced data sets in terms of the representation of the, gen the genome, the, which species they used. So, I think it's important to for us to also conduct our own set of biogeographic analysis to make sure that there's not concord that there's concordance between what other researchers have shown as well as that our data the biogeographic analysis supports the hybridization analysis. So I think definitely going further into sort of biogeographic analyses based on our own data is to me seems like the obvious next step and um, look further into this overlap between QTLs that explain blight resistance, identifying specific genes and identifying genes that may have that also not, not have only gone through introgression but adaptive introgression and also you know put into better context the evolution of cryphonectria and divergence and hybridization. Those are the sorts of next step things that we will follow up. Jared, do you wanna add anything? Well, yeah, Joanna, you had, um, you know, we didn't get to show this, but Jason showed it last time is like we had done, we had looked at what genes are expressed um, in the stems of Chinese chestnut versus American chestnut when they're infected with blight and found some unique um, genes that are expressed specifically in Chinese chestnut, for example. And it'd be interesting to know if any of those uh, potential resistance genes are in, in regions of the genome that seem to be um, undergoing integration between species. Um, so can we, yeah, that's a way to pinpoint it. So I think wrapping this up into one story, it's a really nice story, I think, we look at you know the biology of uh, cryphonectria resistance and wrap it in with the hybridization story. I think that makes a really nice paper um, to discuss. Uh, and so hopefully that's like that's our nature paper. <laughs> hopefully <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, well, this is great. Uh, thank you guys so much, Joanna. This is this is really fantastic stuff, Jared. I know you were integral. I see both Alex and Jason on here. So thank you guys for all your support for this work. Uh, moving forward, it's really important to help us better understand uh, this connection between the disease and, um, or between the the, the pathogen and and the the host. Um, so really important work moving forward. Um, uh, just again, uh, Kendra put a link in the chat to our archives. So we'll process this recording as quickly as we can. It should be up on uh, the Chestnut Chat archives uh, by early next week. Kendra put a link to those Chestnut ar uh, Chat archives, or if you just Google Chestnut Chat archives, you will find them uh, quite easily. Uh, March, we're gonna talk about how to talk about science. Uh, April, we're gonna talk about planting chestnuts. Um, got a couple other uh, subjects in the works for the um, upcoming year, but if you guys do have any uh, uh, requests, let me know, because I got a couple months that are open and always looking for topics that you guys want to hear about. So thanks again for joining us, and I hope to see you uh, a month from now. All right. Take care.